So anyway, I wanted to quickly introduce uh, Brian, who's going to be talking about some really interesting topics that we don't hear much about, and this is to do with fire, uh, fire ecology, fire responses in Mulga and Mitchell grasslands in Queensland. His work goes back for a long, for a long time, as I understand it, primarily working with arid or semi-arid ecosystems, going back to South Africa, working also in places like southwestern Queensland, of course, which is really getting into the hardcore outback. And uh, Brian's a, today, we, Brian's going to be talking to us about, I don't know what he's going to be talking to us about. He's going to be talking to us about the 50-year resurveyed ground cover changes in Queensland's Mulga and Mitchell grasslands. So, Brian, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I, I want to start by, by thanking the 30 or so helpers that actually got our logistics organized to get this done. We've got a picture here of the first of our team. This was organized through an ex-student of mine, that's Jenny up at the top there sitting in the tree. Um, Jenny was an ex-student of mine at USQ in Toowoomba, and uh, she wrote the uh, the text for identification of plants in, in this area. The other characters you see there were all fresh out of uni when they came uh, to, to, to help me back, back then. And uh, now with their beards and their 70-something pedigrees, they all put their hands up. I didn't ask them to help. I told them that I was doing this. And they said, well, we'd like to be in that. And in the end, I didn't do much at all. I ended up in an advisory capacity while these guys did the work. Why this is important to me personally is this is because it is my very first field project in Australia and now rounded off half a century later as my last field work. And if you see how I walk, you'll, you'll understand why it's my loss. I want to thank Yoko for a grand series that, that we've had and not finished yet. We've even having retreats, as you've seen. Yoko, you have done a, a marvelous job of bringing up what I think would be the most interesting series of seminars that I've had in my career. Most amazing speakers that have told me things in, in worlds that I knew nothing about. And while I'm at it, I want to thank Erica Blythe, who uh, converted my scrawl, 700 pages of it, uh, into more or less uh, good language. And uh, she has been in charge of all my computer work uh, for the last 10 years? Yeah. I'm sorry Daniel can't be here because it was his idea. This wasn't my idea to come along here, but I asked so many questions in Yoko's seminars that uh, Daniel came to me and he said, well, why don't you give a talk on it? So I did. And last, I, I want to thank Yoko uh, for organizing for us to get the PowerPoint done specifically by Golo, my ex-neighbor here, who uh, has done what I think is a pretty good job. So I must point out that in this, this study, we didn't set out in 72 to measure climate. We set out to, to measure grazing. Specifically, we were looking at what changes there were. And I must emphasize that we came to climate really by a, a process of elimination, where we're looking at if the vegetation has changed, what could have changed it? And we had 36 sites that were preserved, not totally netted off, because once you, you keep both grazing and fire out of arid vegetation, it will almost certainly go moribund. It would die, use it or lose it, as they say in the footy. So if, if it wasn't overgrazing, was it fire changes? Was it grass-eating termites? Was it locusts? And if it wasn't any of those things, which it wasn't, 
then it's probably climate. So what we've tried to do is to go from what was originally very much a ground cover study. We weren't interested in the increase or decrease of, of the, the crown layer. We were interested in, in the grazing itself, both the grasses and the herbs. So I want to try and do two things. I don't waffle on myself out of time. I want to give you a background to, to the habitat, what we're working with, because the, the semi-air is not too well known in Cairns. We're about rainforests, aren't we? And the VC told us to concentrate on tropical, tropical, tropical. And uh, I think if we can get some idea of how these ecosystems work out in the dry areas, then I can tell you how we measured the vegetation, which was actually by use of the wheel that you can see in that, uh, in that, image that's, that's up there, it's got two red measuring spokes. The original came down every meter, uh, meet, meter point two, and it was the basal cover that we're interested in. We're measuring the percentage of the actual surface of the soil as covered by tufts at ground level, not canopy, not eaten off, but specifically at ground level. So we were collecting the information on ground cover, on the number of species, usually between 20 and 40 uh, different species. So we were, were covering in our 36 sites, something like um, 55 grasses or 65 grasses and 95 herbs. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is the 1972 study where we made, we went to great trouble to try and find areas that had been not overgrazed, but had been subject to the normal ecological forces at, at work, which was drought and grazing by marsupials. So we've tried in this, in this report to find places that were under the natural regime as, as far as possible. Let's look at the next one, which is Jenny's map. This is Jenny Wilson. This is the area that we're talking about from Charleville was our staging post and we moved out to Kulpi and Windora, west of, and we went up to just south of Longreach, and we moved down to Kanamala, which is just short of the New South Wales border. Okay. Let's have the next one. The forces that determine the, the shape of this landscape, the geomorphology, as it's called, are basically water and wind. This is originally a marine ecosystem. So when I come back with, with the first strange looking rocks that look more, more like pieces from a draft set, when the typist looked at me casually and said, that's, that's probably a vertebra from a shark. So as an ignorant migrant, I was, I was learning quite fast that we had a situation which had been marine right across the Southwest and the, uh, the, the, the salt that is deposited there is, is part and parcel of, of that uh, geomorphology. But this just shows the way in which the dust, which comes from the very fine fractions, uh, not, not only the, the clay particles or the soot particles, but also our colloids or our valuable organic colloids in sufficient force to be able to drift right across to New Zealand and stain the snow to a depth of about 13 centimetres in the, in the New Zealand Alps near, near, near Mount King, Mount, Mount Cook rather. This was back in, in, in 87. Let's look at the rain format. Basically, we, we're dealing with the Isa Heights more or less concentrically going in rainfall down to 
only about 100 millimeters uh, just near uh, Lake Eyre, but we have what is the boundary of what is normally considered the, uh, the, the eastern boundary of the, um, the arid zone at uh, 500 millimeters. Next. Now this is the distribution of the two types of ecosystem we're talking about. The first one on the left is the, the strebler, which is the Mitchell grasses, four Mitchell grasses, um, just about always on clays going right across the Barclay Tableland and into the Territory and uh, uh, part of WA. The other map on the right is the one of the Acacia Neura being our, our mulga. And it's much less fussy about soil texture. It comes in on all, all types of soil. The area that we're talking about going down over the New South Wales border into New South Wales gives us a very important research tie up with the New South Wales surveyors. Next. Now, this is a, a very important alignment uh, around the 12 monthly averages going from 1890 through to 2020. It's not just the southwest, up in the right hand corner, we have the little uh, black area showing that it covers the whole of the grazing area. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Very amazing, eh? <laughs> What we're looking at is both the depth of the droughts, how deep they go, looking, looking back at the 1920s. What have I done? I'll it. I can do it for you. Um, we're coming from the, the big droughts just after the turn of the century. And the length of that red area shows how many years that drought lasted. The depth of it going, going vertically shows us just how dry it was in terms of the proportion of the, the rainfall in that time. So what we can see is a lot of short droughts, not very deep after that, that first one, after 1900, but coming up to our end, and we're looking at, at early 1970, which is where our surveys were done. So we had a, a bit of a long drought before us and then a shorter drought just at the time that we were surveying. But if we move along to the end of our time, we can see that the length of these droughts, the number of years that we below the mean starts getting really worrying. And overall, we can say that during that whole 30, we got 13 decades from 1890, that in the first half of that time, about a third of the years were dry years. And in the second half of that 13 decades, we find it getting close to a third of the time or rather uh, half the time rather than a third as it had been before. So drought not becoming the norm, but certainly becoming uh, much more, more frequent. Let's look at the next one, which shows us the continent overall. This is for Australia overall, and we've got the periods of drought at the top, and we've got the periods out of drought on, on, on the left. So what we're trying to do here is indicate that if we take the whole time from 1860, all the rainfall records, about 38% of the time is a serious drought somewhere. And because we're right on the 500 semi-arid arid boundary, uh, we are part of that. Now, why this is important for us is that the Australian semi-arid 
is 20% more variable than other homo climates. If you look around the world and look at the area that I come in from in Southern Africa with the Kalahari Desert and the Namib Desert, then you find that the variation about the mean is much greater. In fact, a fifth greater in Australia with the same homo climate, with the same annual mean. Next. Now, our area concerns the land of the Bujara, which are down below here. Beautiful. And the Kanja, just to the, to the east of them. The Bujara, which is the mob that, that our friend uh, Terry comes from. Um, he's not with us because he's out in the field, which is where he should be. We have these language groups affecting much greater areas than their actual tribal land. These maps are not, not accurate. This is the latest one uh, drawn by, drawn by uh, Dave. Dave Horton, who's taken up the earlier work of Tyndale in the, in the mid-1970s. So these maps are not to be used for land claims or in court cases, but we do know from many of the, the people we talked to that their boundaries were not nice, comfortable blobs like this. They were, in fact, quite jagged areas running up ridges and along creeks. That's where you met the enemy. That's where you met the other clans. And we, we have a fairly clear idea of the way in which some of these who had the best of the developed languages had a much further uh, effect as far as trade goes than their, their own area. We have the Garawali up, up on the, the, the left-hand side. The, the, the Karawali are the subject of a very interesting book by um, Pamela Watson, who has looked very closely at what we today call truth-telling about how the Karawali lands came to be taken over by the squatters. We need to mention here that The natural condition of having a combination of lightning and dry grass goes back millions and millions of years. And as long as we've had that combination, we've had a natural fire season, and that is that the grass is set alight at the time of the dry thunderstorms. Now, what has happened with Aboriginal burning is there's been a very definite change of season and of frequency. And this has given what was or what, what became far from what the pattern was in earlier years. And there's a very good book by Cohen called Aboriginal Environmental Impacts, which indicates how not only the change of fire, but also the change of grass harvesting for seed has changed. The next, please, Colin. So we're dealing with the big catchments from the, uh, the, the Warrego just off our right-hand boundary through to the Paru, onto the Bulla, and up to the Barku. And, and these are pretty important places, not, not only historically, but for a number of our well-known poets who seem to be captured by this country. And many of our poems have had their roots in, in this area. And the next one. Norman Tyndale has tried to give us by putting together all the diaries of the explorers, 
some idea of where the, what he called was the Aboriginal grain belt. Not a, time, not a term we, we, we ever hear in our own lingo, because we know where our grain belt is. But these people had been harvesting, apparently, for something close to 15,000 years in each good season. Most of the Mitchell grasses, many of the panicums, some of the millets, and even spinifex in, in the dry country. Now, we don't know what the effect is, but if one looks at the diaries and the sketches made by the explorers, one gets a very good idea of how long and how big this effect might have been on the Mitchell grass itself. So our coming in and assuming that it was really just uh, fire, fire and, and rainfall that affected the, uh, the Mitchell grasses, this is not the case. We've got four male, uh, main Mitchell grasses. The Curly Mitchell, which is the most important. Then the Bull Mitchell, which usually grows only in depressions. The Barley Mitchell, which looks just like the barley ear. And the Hoop Mitchell, growing on, on very slight differences in the landscape, what one might call micro, micro topography. Let's look at the settlement bank, Golov. So the important feature here is that if, if we look at the vertical and horizontal striped areas, you can pick them at the vertical lines were the, the last, and they were only settled by the squatters in about 1900. And the, the horizontal lines show the, the 1880 settlement. So it's a blink of an eyelid in the grand scheme of things of the ecosystems that, that we are talking about. Next. Now, of great importance for us is this East Australian Basin. The hatched area is what today is known as the Great Artesian Basin. If you went to school in Australia, you'd probably know all about it. If you come from elsewhere, you need to know that in this particular basin that caused the changes in the grazing intensity. We've got an ecosystem, which is semi-arid, which is very variable and which protects itself by drought. The CSIRO some years ago estimated that about 80% of the kangaroos would have died in the big droughts. They don't form big migrations over long distances like the zebra and the wildebeest in, the, in the Central Africa. Rather, they, they move only short distances and they will die on, on the last of the water holes. And when we found the, the artesian water, which is much deeper than what we call sub bores, which is between three and 400 feet usually, which we drilled with the old jumper drills that I grew up with, we now had the American oil company come through in the 1880s looking for oil. I didn't find any oil, they found lots of hot water. And the locals decided we could use that. Soon found out that it was it really had too many minerals in it for, for good irrigation. So they decided on the pattern of what were called bore drains. It's taking the water from the bore, running at a, a level of about one in 300 fall, taking this water into dry Mitchell grass plains that had never had permanent water before, in fact, didn't have any water uh, far, far from the creeks. And this is what made the big change in terms of grazing capacity and the number of animals that, uh, that, that, that could be run there. So the coming of the artesian basin 
caused the biggest ecological upset that, that we've seen in that area. And in my book, it was a disaster. Next. We jump right ahead now to the 1964 scheme of declaring our shires um, drought affected, drought declared, as we call it. And there are two factors that cause people to run out of feed. The one is a lack of rain, and the other is too many animals. And you can take it from me that there are many properties out there that are always in drought. I mean, 80% of the time. So what we've got here in the, in the, uh, the, the pink areas, which is the area we're working in, are properties that, that have been drought declared more than 50% of the time and, and some up, up to 60%. These drought declarations are not dependent on any science at all. They're dependent on politics and who's who and who should get funding for subsidizing either moving their stock or, or bringing in feed. And we have an important job to do now to change that and look at what, what we can do better than this system that's been running since 64. Next. So the situation we've got is the processes that start with the original vegetation at the stop, at the top and through overutilization, we get first a lack of vigor, and then we get a, a, a change in, in the cover, the cover decreases. And finally, we get the botanical composition changing. And that's what we were looking at in, in our study. With uh, 18,000 observations, we thought we had a fairly good base. In some ecosystems, you'll find that the decrease in cover and the botanical composition change are very closely related. And in some ecosystems, if, if you tell the botanists what the composition is, they will tell you quite accurately what the cover is and vice versa. They tell you we've got a 1% cover there. They will know that it doesn't have many, many of our best grasses. Next, please, go. On. A little bit of a diversion because our, our report covers a number of studies in South Africa on Australian grasses. And we have at the bottom of the, 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 the dark South African map there where Cape Town and, and Adelaide come together. We have some very similar vegetation and we were interested in the similar grasses, but they are so similar to look at that when the Australians made Breaker Morant, they decided that the place to make this film was near Peterborough in, uh, in, in South Australia. And uh, it looks like we've got ourselves a situation where we can use the South African research in going into what have become very important uh, research lines for the Australians. Our, our kangaroo grass, which goes by another name there, and our silky top, turpentine grass, our love grasses, our wire grasses, they're all pre-Gondwana. They are the ancient grasses that grew before continental drift. So we have a lot of old grasses and we have quite a few new grasses. So South Africa has a mass of what are called Bushman grasses, where the Mitchell grasses take over in Australia and not one to be seen in South Africa. But modern grasses, and we've got Gondwana grasses, we've got We've got genera like the, the Aerogrostus, which has 55 different species in Queensland, and Aristida, the wire grass, there's about 22 species, all the way through to some genera that have only one. And those interested in speciation need to know 
why poor old Tragus was left behind. The genus Tragus is still one only, while the others have been speciating uh, massively in the last time, sometimes with the help of the taxonomists. Next, please. Now I'm showing you here what the situation was in South Africa where we did a detailed study on the rotational grazing that had been used for the longest in South Africa from 1930 to 72. And we're looking at how those pasture changes and how the slight decrease, you can see my rather vague pencil line of the trend, uh, pretty well the same slope as, as the Australian uh, decrease. And if you look at the names of all the, 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 the different properties around the one that we used and Hanover Town itself, you see they all got the name Fontaine, the Afrikaans for fountain, and there is no way you could set up shop in that area unless you had at least one fountain. Next. Now, these are our sites. We tried to look for sites that had not been overgrazed for a long time, and we thought we'd find them in two places. We thought we'd find them far from water, and we thought we'd find them uh, in areas that for some special reasons, the owner had not been using those paddocks heav heavily for, for a long time. We've got 36 sites from down on the border, uh, right up to south of Longreach. And we've been going back to those sites, photographing them, measuring them, and trying to get an, an exact record of the way in which things have changed. Now with our GPS, which we didn't have before, we were able to use the GPS, the handheld GPS, giving us something like five decimal places, which is just a few meters, the marvelous uh, technique for our getting exactly the same spot instead of trying to describe it as half a mile from, half a mile from cheapy siding to the west, the third telephone pole after the gate to the west. And we've done this and used three iterations. We've taken all those that, that we could find. We've then taken all those that we could find exactly, which is the second iteration. And then we've taken our third iteration is those sites which we could pinpoint exactly and which hadn't been disturbed. We had expected that over half a century, there would be uh, 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 almost certainly uh, an elimination of some of our sites by disturbance, by change of um, change of fences, change of management, even a golf club clubhouse being built slap in the middle of one of them. So we're dealing with, let's look at the next one. We're dealing originally with four main sites. We looked at the laterites up, up at the top, which were the hard, very acid soils carrying mulga. Most of the sites were on that. We looked at sandy red soils down below. A goodly number of our sites were on that. We looked at rocky plateaus up, up at the top where we only had three. And then all the cracking clays that uh, covered the Mitchell grass and the associated plants, uh, many, many of them. And what we were looking at was basically to find how the number of species differed with the soil, and in our case, uh, topsoil texture. So we're looking at 31 species on the laterites, we're looking at 20 on the, on the red earths, only 13 on the rocky plateaus, and 25 on, on the clays. And as far as cover went, we vary from 1.1 on the rocky plateaus to about 4.4 on our red sandy soils, which unexpectedly was considerably higher than on the Mitchell grass cracking clays. 
next one. Right. Now, I don't know if there are many botanists in, in, in the audience, but we have, we've been using the old Clemencian, this is the Clements, the uh, uh, US ecologist who, who set the, uh, the nomenclature between climax, meaning the highest form of development on that soil rainfall combination, down to the pioneers, which occurred when you had bare soil or when you had old cultivated fields that, that were coming back. This uh, type of uh, ecological terminology was started by Tansley uh, way back in the 40s in the United Kingdom but the, the Americans took over. And we have a problem in Australia that to, we have to satisfy ourselves whether in fact our succession in the semi-arid actually moves from these droughty uh, dry areas where the pioneers take over on bare soil after drought or cultivation and whether they do in fact move through a subclimax to a climax. And there are several ecologists in Australia who are not having that at all saying, ours is not progressive, our succession is in fact cyclical. It's a stop start that in fact never gets through in this kind of progressive order, the sequence that uh, Clemencian succession was supposed to do. Next, please. Well, this is the way we recorded the, the, our recording sites from, from 72. We'd have the site number and then we would work out, we would uh, have each of these species on uh, the punch cards. Anyone here old enough to remember the punch card system? Wonderful where we could go to the first decimal place, at least in sorting, which were the most dominant, dominant in this case, meaning the most frequent. From at the top where we have the, uh, the Mitchell grass followed by the, uh, the Flinders grass and then the button grass and then onto the big weeds. And we converted these in our, in our latest survey to those on this 50 year original that were above 15% and above 7%. And those above 7% we called very frequent. Uh, and those above 7% we called common. And those below that we called present. Next one. Now, in passing, we have to recognize from the land units that we're talking about that we have some cracking clays that, that are either very deeply uh, fractured in, in the drought, what we call self melting or they are hard setting. And you can see in each of them that we have self munching and hard setting within the same Mugger lands unit. This happens to be the Brigola, Acacia Harper Fuller. Or we go down to the jump ups, the uh, residual uh, sandstone hills of, of the area. Also some of them hard setting, strongly acid, and then down to the Gigi which is the most long lived of our trees, down to self mulching, some hard setting. What I'm getting at is that within these management units, we have some very important local differences in whether we're getting to that, that single soil criterion that determines the, the runoff from the area. Next one. So this is how, how we did our survey. 
um, the, the top one, site nine in 72. And that would have been with my Leica camera half a century ago at exactly the same spot as the one that we've come to, as I say, to the, to the fifth decimal place. Um, about as accurate as you can get, obviously a different time of day. Next. These are our most recent field sheets. The detail doesn't uh, matter too much, but if Golo can just indicate the ones that we have made very frequent, which is our 15% on the old tack, and our common next door to it, which is our 7%, and then others which we called uh, present. We've got a, a lot of information here that hasn't been used in, in, in this talk anyway. Next one. And when these first came in, this is the way the dominance have changed. We've grouped the species that are on our most recent survey into three. First are the new dominance, meaning they weren't dominant in 72. The next group down below are the absent, those that were dominant, but aren't dominant anymore. And the third group are those that haven't changed at all. They're just as dominant now as they were then, as they were then. And I can tell you from a personal point of view, I was like, when these first start coming in from the field teams, I was sitting in my office here in Kawara Beach, receiving them. I was like, like a kid on Christmas morning, waiting for the next surprise, because I honestly didn't know what was going to come of this. And we were able then to detail these, the species perhaps not too important for, for, for this particular audience, but we're looking at grouping these, photographing them, and then we will codify these to an eight letter code, the first four letters of both the genus and the species, which will give each, each of these plants a unique number for the statisticians. We can only gauge from our own experience whether the, 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 the lists are different or not different from before. But we, if, we, if we use statistics, we can use Bartlett's heterogeneity measure. And if Mr. Bartlett says they're different, they're different. And we'll be doing that when we put this into, into a journal article next year. Next. So we're looking at sites. These are at Gilruth Plains, which is the oldest of our sites, which came through from the... Uh, how am I going for time, Bella? Not too well. I've got 10 minutes. Oh, I'll be like the politicians and talk right through question time, mate. Eh? We've got a situation here where we have got some very important um, what shall I call them? This is what's happened when we have a reserved area which was flogged for six years by CSIRO on their Gilruth Plain station. And then they had outside that flogged area, which, is, which was netted, and it shouldn't have been, and we've got the grazed area. And we can see the vast differences in the, the amounts of, of the different uh, dominance at that time. Um, Golo, we might just go right through to... Uh, the, uh, the, the next slide and the next slide. When we look at our rainfall, we can, we can simply say that we've taken the rainfall from 1890 through to 2020. And if we look at the decreases, we've, we've got up to 140 millimetres less rain per annum on average at places like Longreach, but we've got an increase at places like Kanamala. Next one. And as far as the temperature goes, not too much difference between them. We're talking here about the increase in temperature per decade. And this is different from what we get when we look at 
the the global averages which go to uh, considerably higher figures. Let's go right to the last one. Keep on going. This one. Let's finish with looking at the wonderful book by Nash. Roderick Nash wrote, wrote a book some years ago in 89 called The, the Rights of Nature. And he's looking at how rights have come from the Magna Carta in, in 1215, which is looking at the rights of the English barons, moving up to the Declaration in America of the Declaration of Independence, 1776, then the emancipation of slaves up to the 19th, Amend the 19th Amendment in America of women getting rights, and we're certainly copying it in Australia as far as this goes, not far too long dragging a chain here, through to Native Americans, up to the start of the uh, labor union movements in 38, the black civil rights movement, and through to what is now for us very important, the rights of nature. And Nash gives us great detail of showing how the rights of nature, in fact, uh, have been too long subdued, and they, they give the details of a, a court case where a number of solicitors went to the High Court in America to check whether living organisms that just happen not to have language have rights. And this was the great trip around the, the sequoias in a case called Do Trees Have Standing? And those of you interested in natural rights might want to have a look at this. Now, sorry, Yoko, I've sort of stuffed up your program time-wise. I apologize for that. We want to try going into questions. How do we work this?